Welcome to this session of AIJC 2020. Just some quick housekeeping uh, before we start. There is translation in the session, so choose your language. Uh, go to the uh, global icon on the bottom of your Zoom screen and click on English or French and mute the main channel so you only get one sound channel. You will see Roy Blumenthal on the screen. He is our resident caricaturist and sketch noter working live during uh, the session. And you'll see his work from time to time or certainly at the end of the session. Please use the Q&A function for your questions or comments and the facilitator will pick them up from there. Have a great session. and welcome everyone to this session on day three of the African Investigative Journalism Conference 2020. This is the first edition of this annual event that our host, Bits Journalism, has held online out of the 16 that they have held so far. This, as you know, is because of the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Despite the change of format, it's gratifying to be joined by people from all over Africa and indeed around the world. The title of this session is Persevering Under Tough Conditions, The Challenges of African Investigative Journalism. In this session, we bring together five journalists from different regions of Africa to share their views of the challenges that journalists face and how they are dealing with them. So welcome again. My name is Benon Habert Oluka. I'm the Africa editor for the Global Investigative Journalism Network. I'm based in Kampala, Uganda, and I'll be your moderator today. Before we proceed, I must alert you that we are offering translation into French during this session. And by now, you'll have seen the instructions on your screen, and they should also be on the, in the chat box. So again, welcome to this session about the challenges that investigative journalists face in Africa and how to overcome them. I'll introduce today's speakers in a moment, but first, a little bit of, of information about the Global Investigative Journalism Network for those of you who may not know uh, or are not familiar with it. GIJN is the largest uh, global network of nonprofit investigative journalism organizations. We have 184 member organizations in 77 countries worldwide. 17 of those are from Sub Saharan Africa. However, we work with journalists everywhere in nonprofit, in commercial organizations, and with freelancers. We were established to connect and support all journalists, and we are doing that um, across the world and definitely around Africa. Now, let's introduce our speakers. I'm delighted that we're joined today by leading investigative journalists representing English speaking West Africa, French speaking West Africa, North Africa, East Africa, and Southern Africa. They'll give us presentations that will together last about 50 minutes, and then we'll take uh, some questions. So first, um, I will introduce Victor Bwire, who is the Deputy Chief Executive and Programs Manager at the Media Council of Kenya. Victor is a distinguished journalist and writer in his own right. He is currently doing a study into nonprofit centers for investigative journalism across Africa, and he will share preliminary findings uh, from his study with us in this session. Uh, second is Mont Motunrayo Alaka, who is the executive director of the Wale Soinka Center for Investigative Journalism, which is based in, the, in Nigeria, as many of you might have already guessed. She has over 14 years experience in journalism and is a 2019 John S. Knight Fellow at Stanford University in the United States. We are also joined by Arnaud O. Udrayogo, who is the coordinator 
of the Senozo Center for Investigative uh, Journalism uh, in West Africa. It's based in Burkina Faso. And now is an experienced journalist, uh, an experienced investigative journalist, and most recently helped to coordinate the Finch and Files investigations across West Africa and most of uh, Africa. Um, from Egypt, we have Gihad Ahmed Abbas, who is an award-winning invest award investigative journalist. Um, every year, I think, uh, uh, Gihad bags an award or two for her work. Um, she will share with us insights from her experience doing investigative journalism in North Africa. Finally, uh, we have Adrian Basson, who is the editor-in-chief of News24 in South Africa. He too is an award-winning investigative journalist with uh, his last accolade, uh, or one of the accolades in his bag being the 2012 CNN Africa Print Journalist of the Year Award. And that's really, that was really a big deal. So uh, Adrian is also a published author and uh, his book uh, is also an investigative uh, work of uh, journalism. Um, we would also like to hear from you in the audience and welcome questions uh, from the audience. Uh, please send your questions throughout the session in the Q&A box that you should be able to see at the bottom of your screen. So let's start um, with Victor, who will share with us an overview from the research that he's been doing. Uh, Victor, please, over to you. Thanks, uh, Bernard. Uh, pleasure and uh, nice words from you and, and colleagues. Uh, it's a pleasure for me uh, to join you at this time. Like you said, in addition to working there, I worked as an investigative journalist for the Nation Media Group in East Africa for, for quite some time. So it's, it's work that I I I I I, I am for. Now quickly uh, the study that you mentioned, and I'll ask uh, my colleague to project it, is uh, a thinking around uh, mapping out uh, investigative centers and hubs in Africa. A thinking that has been brought together by the FOIA Media Institute and which who are doing a joint uh, work and, and and other players, and just to establish where is quality public interest. Uh, investigative happening in Africa. And, and from what we are doing, so it's purely a mapping out a, a study and, 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 and we used, uh, the methodology was largely uh, to use uh, centers like the, the groups we belong to, the, the, the global network, uh, which uh, Herbert, uh, I mean, Benon helped us a lot in reaching out to a number of the centers. We also used, uh, uh, so we sent out a few questionnaires to a number of, of colleagues. Some responded, some have not responded. Then we also do an analysis of our websites and, and public information on some of the centers and some of the work that is happening. And we also read books about uh, Professor uh, Anthony has done some work and, and, and Reuters also produced a latest uh, a study on, on investigative work in Africa. So it's a combination that questionnaire were done, a few interviews, physical interviews were done with a few colleagues and then an, an analysis of uh, some publicly uh, information on investigative uh, work happening in Africa. And, and so far, so these are purely interim thought, uh, results that we have not yet uh, finalized. And, 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 and I need to uh, request that from the talking, we want to request that if of you uh, has, would not appear or never got uh, this questionnaire, please feel free to add us more information or send us information on your center, the work you are doing. And we are happy to include you in the final uh, report that we are working on. So, so that, that's largely is it. Uh, and, and from that work, which uh, purely like I mentioned, uh, uh, was affected. We did it in the last uh, two months. And obviously our intention was to, to, to finish it by this September, by September. But what happened is that because like uh, Benon mentioned, the Corona pandemic has had a big impact on colleagues and a number of them uh, either working from home or, or not having, have not uh, been able uh, to respond to some, but we have managed to call out a few who we have contacts. Uh, and again, which also through uh, this uh, uh, conference participants helps us with a number of contacts for a number of uh, you who are already participating in this. So we mixed, uh, the, we, we mixed uh, the way of getting uh, information and contacts of these centers. And, and we're happy. I put there my email uh, and, and those of you 
who have no, are not appearing kindly and you feel uh, feel free to share with us more information on what work you are doing and we'll be happy to uh, to include you so uh, second slide please i mean so largely the, the, that was it uh, the third one please uh, and, and, and a number of observations come up. And like I mentioned, that are, these are purely interim uh, uh, findings. The first likely is that there's a resurgence of investigative journalism across sub-Saharan Africa. That, that, that a lot of work is coming out, fantastic work being done uh, through uh, Africa. And from the study we did, we got responses from nearly 15 countries that responded and over uh, over 25 centers. In fact, now there are already now about 30 centers we have received and they are showing fantastic work. Some of the names are there and some of you are there obviously, but we see a resurgence of, of investigative quality public interest journalism across Africa with a number of centers, especially in West Africa, uh, South Africa, and, 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 and East Africa coming up doing a wonderful work. Some of the centers have won even international awards uh, from the work they are doing. So I will not bother to read the whole list, but this is just some of the, uh, the names uh, that we got out uh, from, uh, from the study. And, and you can see uh, some of the names uh, Benon mentioned, some of, the, some of the panelists here actually work for the, some of these centers. So, so, so we are seeing that. And, and part of, of what is coming out is that that uh, in this uh, resurgence we are seeing uh, tendencies towards uh, uh, people uh, using online platforms online platforms to supplement traditional media that is no longer the traditional uh, liberal media that is doing work and obviously we see the challenges but and also what is happening is collaborative efforts through integrated approaches, a number of um, a number of centers are releasing their stories through either online and, and largely online and, and print. So a number of uh, you are doing a lot of work online and print media in invest, uh, investigative centers. A number of the centers also, in addition to doing investigative work, they are also doing uh, some of them are purely training centers. They are producing, doing a lot of they are not necessarily journalistic work, but like Ben, uh, ben mentioned, nonprofits doing a lot uh, collaboratively with journalistic uh, journalistic institution and enterprises or individual. Uh, individual independent uh, producers uh, give, uh, doing a lot of work. So that's some of the things that are happening. Next, please. So, so, so that is happening and uh, we are happy uh, for that. And, and some of the, these things I've already mentioned, a number of these centers that are doing this wonderful work and you can mention them, Wale Senka, Champs Media, African Uncensored, uh, AJ Center in South Africa. You will see that there are very small outfits that are highly professional. That in, in fact, in the number of the centers we, we are looking at, we see a, a staff between one and 10 employees. So they're not huge, big enterprises, but a num um, largely a number of journals. And you'd see later that a number of them are people who are frustrated or who got frustrated working in mainstream media or used to head mainstream media de uh, investigative desks or special desks who then for one reason or another come out and form alliances or, and register their own independent center. Those are, these are highly uh, I mean, uh, professional, small outfits that are doing a lot of uh, great work. Look at African centered equally that, uh, that fight. I mean, those are just centers who, who, which were reporting. And, and we are saying that again, in the, num in the centers we, we, we interacted with, a number of them are online platforms. Uh, interestingly, that online platforms are largely picking up. In fact, 57% of the centers we talk to do their work online. They produce their work online. And that's a, that, that's a big, and tele, I mean, print comes at 26%, television at 9%, radio is still very low. And this is something we have had discussions with a number of people like uh, Wellington Jongesa who works on an investigative radio program in Kenya here and on Radio Millen. Uh, there are not a number of people using radio uh, in investigative work yet. Uh, in studies are showing radio is still a very prevalent medium in Africa as a, as, as, as a medium of exchange. So these are just some of the things. A number of them are using mixed tools of production. So we are seeing a lot of, of, of collaborative efforts in data, visuals, data analytics uh, in producing this work. So quite fantastic work uh, where people are using visuals uh, to enhance uh, attractiveness and, 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 and sharing of information. 
So again, this is also in terms of tapping into specialized audiences that some people just want to see visuals, some people just want to see data. And, and, and so the, the general around data journalism is gaining uh, prominence in Africa and people like Code Africa, for example, and others are working collaborating with newsrooms or independent producer, producers uh, to do fantastic work. Next, please. Uh, I mean, and like I mentioned, collaborations both within Africa and across Africa and across continents that increasingly, especially nonprofit journalism, these small centers are working uh, with, inter with both local uh, nonprofits, both local research institutions, both local civil society organizations, but are also tapping in, into the, the bigger uh, global uh, surge in, in investigative support. So a lot of uh, international uh, support is happening, and you see uh, people like uh, BB, BBC Eye on Africa, for example. For example, see, you see uh, these are happening. The, the global investigative journal, which which Herbert, uh, I mean, uh, heads. These are these are big uh, across co continent uh, initiatives that are helping working uh, together with the local uh, to, to produce fantastic work across Africa. Uh, next, please. Sustainability, a major problem, and a number of desks in Africa, those of you who have worked in newsroom, people have been complaining why uh, traditional media largely is not doing a lot of investigative work. Was one of them was in uh, sustainability and resources, that for you to do a serious uh, investigative work, you need some resources. Some of these stories need a lot of time, a lot of investment, and for that, a number of desk, uh, a number of media houses have scrapped off their investigative desks. Uh, and, and, and have one or two, and most of them, unless they're doing collaborative work, they are not engaging. So this is uh, one of the challenges, but we are seeing, uh, especially this small out, I mean, and even a uh, big uh, institution, uh, media enterprises, teaming up and coming up with very creative, innovative sustainability uh, models, and, 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 and but the, 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 the outriding thing that I see in the, the smaller institutions we are saying uh, is the support from philanthropic organizations, that a number of them are the Bill Gates, the Open Society Foundations, uh, I, I mean, and other players are in a big way collaborating with some of these centers in doing the great work they're doing. Next. Uh, challenges, uh, a big number, quite a big list of why investigative journalism, while uh, we are saying we are seeing a resurgence, but, but there are still a few challenges which people are dealing with. One, lack of resources that a number would learn to do more stories, more content, but like we mentioned, we need, they need resources and uh, saying, talking about time consuming. So a number of them in the research raised those issues of, of the, the resources to do their work. The increasing issue of safety uh, for journalists, a number of journalists, and, and, and if you looked at the global figures that are being released, the number of journalists uh, across our countries who are facing serious intimidation challenges and even death, some of them in prison, some of their media houses have been uh, closed down, is around public interest journalism, investigative the journalism that they are doing. So the, number, the issue of safety of journalists of concern, which has led obviously to the issue of self-censorship, the issue of huge defamation costs when we are taken to court. And, and you know, sometimes people temper with our court system. So in a number of countries, a number of journalists are facing sometimes fictitious uh, charges simply because of their work, but it's presented in a way uh, that they did a bad. The issue of lack of capacity, again, uh, and, and there's a study that FOIA is also doing on investigate the issue of training of investigative journalism. A number of our training co uh, colleges do not specialize in investigative journalism. They do general uh, journalism training. So a number of journalists who would want uh, to, to, to engage need uh, skills uh, to do investigative interpretative journalism. Then uh, repressive laws, a number of our countries still have uh, weird laws, official secrets act. Some of them have not passed the, the, the access to information law. A number of them do not have a whistleblower protection law. Some of them are still maintaining insult laws and other prohibitive. The others use the national security laws to, 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 to stop uh, and have, uh, frustrate a journalist against uh, da, da, uh, investing in investigative work. So that's still a challenge that uh, the, the regulatory system still a challenge. Then obviously, there's really the issue of lack of solidarity among the journalists themselves. Uh, that, that, that while we are talking about possibilities and opportunities in joint 
in, in joint uh, in joint productions that but 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 uh, there's still that rivalry and the issue of exclusive and people don't want to share even simple that would have done public interest next i think i'm almost on the last done so that's just a rough overview <laughs> Of, of what some of the interim results are coming up from the study. Thank you, uh, and back to you, Benon. Thank you, Victor, for that roundup. Uh, you've given us a good uh, overview of what's happening around the continent. And um, so I will now move to the other panelists, uh, starting with Moton Rayo. Moton Rayo, your organization has uh, uh, held an award for investigative journalists the Wallace Oinka Award for Investigative Reporting, that's now in its 15th year. Um, it will be exciting to know from you, and I know you've been gathering a lot of information, what does the picture look like from all the stories that you gather from investigative journalists, those that you train, those that you interact with, uh, please go ahead and share with us. Thank you, Benon. So I would start um, with a story uh, this is Africa, we love stories. Um, so an ancient Greek paradox about uh, who was here first. Is it a good, is it the egg or is it the chicken? And the chicken always believes that it was there first. And in this instance, I'm labeling the chicken as the media and the egg as good governance. And um, the chicken is the media. So the narrative from the media mostly is that we enable good governance and we enable democracy. And this is true. This is what we do. There is proof that uh, media enables good governance, it enables democracy, it helps social econ economic conditions of countries, and it pay, plays a key role in society. The narratives that we do not that we need to begin to pay more attention to is that the presence of good governance, democratic crazy, um, strong social economic conditions, including human rights, uh, access to human rights, uh, like uh, information and education, are uh, also conditions that actually make media function well. Um, when we want to question this, we should um, ask America, for instance. We see the democracy determines media as much as uh, the media determines democracy. Good government determines media as much as um, the media determines good governance. So this is still hard of who is first for the media. It's very much hard. Um, however, I wouldn't linger on that debate. I will move to the so what question. The biggest challenge of this region, as uh, Victor has mentioned, and I'm, he mentioned it as media, but I'm starting from the region, is welfare, security, and corruption, which have also um, slashed with our value system. The indices of high rates of corruption, you know, most of the countries in Africa are struggling democracy, the poor governance, the poor socioeconomic realities, uh, they affect West Africa and they do affect the whole of Africa. So when we have understanding of the paradox of the chicken and the egg and the cause and effect uh, story that it tells us, then as media professionals, we need to begin to approach our profession with more humility, that we don't just determine things. The things around us also determine how our work goes. And uh, because of this, uh, we approach our work with even, with even more dexterity and with humility. And for me, um, humility makes you introspect. It makes you sit down and think about what is happening around my organization, the World Training Center for Investigative Journalism, uh, does a lot of media monitoring. Uh, we do a lot of monitoring of media reports. And uh, we have done this on education, oil and gas, electricity, girls and women issues, just to mention a few. And a lot of times when we engage media leaders with the figures that we got, we uh, the data that we have on them. A lot of times they are surprised. They're surprised at where they are. And it shows us that um, that uh, self-reflection is sometimes missing in the media. A lot of times 
they start with surprise, but they also begin to tell us, yes, that is true. And we're able to engage on the challenges that they have. So the same challenges that Africa and I'm focusing on West Africa now has are the challenges that the media has. Welfare, you know, where all the media access to basics, including information, education that guarantees that information, um, economic empowerment. If we look at the media, a lot of layoffs, uh, especially during COVID-19, which shows um, welfare is an issue. Um, I'll still come back to welfare. Security is also an issue for, for the media. Um, security, whether it is financial, legal, physical, the ownership structure of the media, uh, we all know that um, a lot of our media actually have um, are owned by people who are affiliated to politicians or who are politicians themselves. And this affects how the media does its work. Um, access to information laws, um, I won't go into the details because of time. And, uh, but there are examples of repressive laws that were colonial military have been carried over even in democracies. In, in Africa, and this is affecting um, the region. Also, uh, still on security, you know, again, a lot of examples from Senegal, Les Echoes was, was attacked on March 26, according to um, Article 19. And, you know, uh, we've had a lot of attacks to the media, especially during COVID-19. So poor ethics and value system, this affects believability, it affects credibility which affects the bottom line of the media. If people don't believe you, um, there is no reason they are going to buy you. And I often say that uh, if media is a product, credibility will be its unique selling point. And if uh, the media is not um, selling, then it has no business. And the business aspect is, is a major issue for the media. So these three biggest challenges are with us, welfare, security, corruption, which I would call value system and ethics. What do I think is the way forward? Uh, I feel that we really do have to fix the economics of the media without jeopardizing our ethics. We have to fix, um, the values are important, but the media has to be able to be sustainable. And um, I know that, uh, I'll go back to my previous slides, and we can do this by collaboration with stakeholders. We can do this by the way that we, we work with stakeholders. Uh, it will put us in better stance to fight security problems and collaborate with other stakeholders. Uh, so I checked uh, some top country, some top media organizations that uh, are listed as top media organizations in the world. Three of them are not news media organizations: Walt Disney, Alphabet, and uh, Facebook. And then I found that they have three things in common, and I want to propose these three things as things that we need to do in addition to professionalism and ethics and sustainability, which Fortika has uh, mentioned. Uh, they focus, this organization's focus on audience and communities. And I'm using a, a model that I call Rush to talk about this. I've thought of this model for about seven years now, and I had an opportunity to study it more while in St at Stanford uh, from last year to August this year. And it's a model that I call rush. It is reports until something happens because African has a dear need to, to get something to happen, for, for change to happen. I'll round up quickly. So we need to focus on communities, communities of geography, communities of interest. And uh, we need to co collect this raw data to do this. We need to go mobile. We need to use online. Uh, thankfully, the report that was given before I spoke shows that a lot of uh, media organizations are moving online. We do need to engage our audience and know that they're important. And we also need to have, uh, to have uh, content as ask. We need to focus on content. So the Rush model, it leads on intersection of communities as the strongest link to change. It is proposing that Africa seeks to build media houses with business models that are inch on stakeholders engagement communities and community using um, technology. So back to the egg and chicken story, uh, we do need to acknowledge our other stakeholders apart from media as being important. And we do need to acknowledge that we are 
co-stakeholders and we need to build this model for media for investigative journalism together. Thank you. Thank you, Martin Rayo, for that insightful uh, presentation, well told with a good, good analogy. Um, I will move straight away in the interest of time to uh, a presentation from Gihad Abbas, uh, who is an investigative journalist based in Egypt. Gihad, please. Hi, thank you very much. Um, I will focus on, on two main points. Uh, first of them, it's uh, the freedom of information. Uh, mainly, I will talk about um, the challenges that Arab African countries um, are included. Um, first, first, this is freedom of information. There are a few countries could take a good step, like Tunisia, which had a law in 2016 provided the right to get access to the information from any official institution. Um, and Morocco had also a step before, it's the same like Tunisia, and some other countries, Arab countries, like Yemen, Jordan, but other countries like Egypt, which has a population of 100 million citizens, didn't take such a step. Um, it makes it much harder for the reporters to get information as well to force the sources to provide a reply on what we are investigating about. From my experience, uh, not having a freedom of information law in Egypt, it was an obstacle and it's still an obstacle and a challenge that make you take more time and efforts on your investigative work. And mostly, if you couldn't depend on open sources while you are working on this investigation, uh, you have to follow leaks and it, it needs more time, more efforts to practice checking that leaks, um, it's a longer process. And sometimes you have to get back to sources, a backup so sources to confirm or deny the information you have during your research process. Um, it's also not having a freedom of information or access to get inf to information in such countries, in Arab countries. Um, it it makes it more complicated uh, to, to get the right of reply. After finishing your research, uh, doing your investigation, you need to have a right to re reply, um, sometimes you can't force sources to reply. Um, I had a similar situation during working on investigation for BBC. It's called Behind the Mask, Last King Tut Tour. And we had um, to get a soft interview with the people on power and another hard interview. Because you know that you can't force sources to talk to you to uh, get more details from them. So we need, uh, we need to leave more details. And in the second interview, we asked questions. Some of them, some sources, they refused. So we sent them the right of reply. Uh, there is a second challenge, a very important one, we are facing in the Arab countries. Uh, Arab African countries that state controlled when the, the state or the government controlling everything when you are living and working as well in a state controlled country it makes your risk assessment very much longer and harder uh, because you can't um, you can't uh, decide what, what the consequences will be we need to think more about the consequences after publishing the story, who will be upset after publishing your story, what can they do, what's your legal advice about your story, are, are your sources who revealed information or helped you during your research are safe or not. You have to consider all these questions when you are working on your investigation. Sometimes 
um, I had not to use an interview with a source. I knew the source wouldn't would get her hurt after uh, what he, uh, he has said. Uh, even, even if he know the consequences and approved, but it's a, it's a code of ethics. You have to uh, consider all uh, the risks. And so um, we couldn't use it, the interview with the source. And I did extra work to get confidential documents, to get more confident documents that proved the story. And I used it as a replacement for the uh, for his testimony. Um, I think it's a, it's a, it's the main points uh, I wanted to share with you, and um, um, it's all uh, it's all I had. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Gehad. Um, you have introduced the very important elements. Uh, to the challenges that we face, and that that is the legal uh, hurdles that journalists often have to, uh, to 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 overcome when trying to do investigations. Um, I will now move on to Adrian Baston, who is the editor in chief of News Twenty Four in South Africa. Uh, please, Adrian, uh, share with us uh, the experiences that. Um, journalists in South Africa have the challenges and how you're trying to overcome them. Thank you. Hi, Benin and colleagues. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Um, I, <clears throat> I thought about um, this question very hard because there's obviously a lot of challenges in the space of investigative journalism when you are trying to uh, reveal other people's secrets and um, show the world things that they don't want you to show. Um, it's inherently risky, um, but I limited my response to the following topics. Um, um, so in terms of challenges uh, facing investigative journalists in our area, um, of course, the first one that comes to mind, uh, first colleague that comes to mind in the recent past is, uh, was Hopewell uh, Chinono uh, in, in Zimbabwe. Um, who was arrested after revealing uh, the uh, COVID-19 corruption involving the president Mnangagwa's son. So um, I think that was probably the most perturbing um, and disturbing um, development in our area in the last few months. Um, and we are very thankful that due to international pressure and the spotlight and highlight that was placed on Hopewell's case, uh, he was released on bail. He still faces trial. Um, closer to home in South Africa, um, one of your colleagues previously, Victor, also referred to it, um, is the economy, uh, the economy of news, the economy, the business of what we do. And uh, um, I think when I'm, when I'm confronted with the question, what are the biggest challenges faced by investigative journalists, uh, I almost want to answer which investigative journalists, there's a very few of us left. Um, I think, uh, you know, a very pertinent point must be the the, uh, the, the small size of investigative journalism team, specifically in mainstream media. Uh, we've heard a lot about positive developments in terms of uh, investigative units and outfits like Amabungani and others, um, but we definitely see a dearth of investigative journalism in mainstream media newsrooms um, as the media sector uh, suffers from a lack of advertising, with advertising moving to uh, to digital and not to to news digital, but to social digital, um, uh, and also as as we see publications going down and behavior changing, so I think um, you know inherent part of the future of investigative journalism journalism will have to be a rethink of the of the business model of funding investigative journalism. Um, I'm of the opinion that it cannot only be donor funded and, 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 and um, based in small but very professional investigative units. I think you do need um, the mainstream media um, still invested in investigative journalism. You need public broadcasters doing investigative journalism. Um, I mean, it lies at the heart of journalism, um, being critical, probing and revealing information that others wants to keep secret. So I think the downturn in the media industry in South Africa, on the continent and globally, um, is definitely also having an impact on investigative journalists. 
Um, secondly, I think the, uh, the way that online and social media specifically um, is used to threaten investigative journalists um, as is used as weapons against investigative journalism is a major threat. Uh, we saw in South Africa, not only with the Gupta leaks, but um, basically with all big stories we do now, that um, almost in the next few hours, there's a campaign on Twitter against you, your publication and your story, um, often run by anonymous bots, um, but fueled by real people who as a business now get paid to undermine our work and to sow confusion about our work. So this is classical disinformation and misinformation campaigns, which is not a new phenomenon, but um, social media has given these uh, detractors of the truth, these tools uh, to uh, confuse the public. And I think we're going to have to up our game as, as, as journalists to fight this um, social media misinformation campaigns that often leads our readers um, being confused um, and, and mistrusting media. Um, thirdly, um, access to information remains an issue in South Africa. We do have good legislation in terms of public access to information, but it takes an inordinate amount of time and resources um, to get these documents. Um, we are often forced to appeal, um, ultimately go to court, and when you go to the High Court in South Africa, if you want to open a case, uh, you need a few hundred thousand rands, if not a million rand, just to start that case. So it is incredibly expensive, which often means we we need to, we we don't proceed to um, uh, actually uh, 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 go to court um, and and argue our case uh, because of the of the cost uh, linked to to taking up uh, these access to information cases against government and government agencies to court. And lastly, uh, the fourth point I will I will just uh, mention is surveillance of journalists. Um, we still have a major concern that journalists are, are under surveillance, specifically um, telephones and digital communication. Uh, we had a big breakthrough case last year um, from Ama Bungani and specifically my colleague Sam Sol, uh, who realized that his phone was being um, intercepted and who then successfully challenged our legislation around mass interception, uh, where the police uh, or the prosecuting agency can, can give a lot of numbers to a judge um, under false pretenses and get all those numbers intercepted. Um, we challenged that, or Sam and Amabungani challenged that, and that act was declared unlawful by the High Court um, and is being um, processed at the moment. Um, what can be done? so that it's not only doom and gloom. I think um, new business models will have to be born. Um, and personally at News24, um, South Africa's largest news website, we have recently launched a subscription service. We believe that reader revenue is at the heart of the future of good journalism, that um, readers have to pay those who can. Um, we have a mixed model uh, called the freemium model where uh, the majority of our content is still available for free, but our premium content, including most of our investigative journalism, is paid for for subscribers. So I fundamentally believe that um, there's a change of culture and behavior that we as journalists need to drive to educate our readers why they need to pay for good journalism. Um, it is not something new. It's always been the case with newspapers. Um, but for 20 plus years, we gave it away for free online. And that is something that we have to change. Um, other, other publications um, towards the north has showed us the way in, in how to get this right. I also think that um, we're going to uh, uh, have to start being much clearer about how we take on um, harassment um, and threats over social media. Uh, we probably need to start, start engaging these social media platforms like Facebook and Twitter much more intensively um, as publications, as countries, and probably even as a continent, um, and start having very tough discussions with them who are ultimately using our content to drive their own traffic on their platforms, but are not giving us the protection against harass harassment, hate speech, um, and even death threats. Um, this cannot continue, um, and we will need to um, either need them coming to the party or have to uh, find a way to, to actually litigate against these social platforms if they do not give us that support. Um, 
And then in terms of um, surveillance um, and access to information, um, I guess the only way there is to go to the courts, uh, which we have done um, in South Africa. Um, I think uh, the last thing I would like to say is that I think it's very important for me that we um, uh, start to cultivate a new generation of investigative journalists, young people for whom it may seem as a incredibly hard job to get into with all the threats, with the lack of funding, um, with social media weaponization. Um, but ultimately, we need to also bring in a new generation of investigative journalists um, who can take the baton from us, who can work with us, um, and who can use um, specifically online tools um, to, to increase and to improve this wonderful job that, that we all love so much. Uh, I will leave it at that for now. Thanks, Benin. Thank you, Adrian, for that uh, insightful presentation. I particularly like the rallying call that you have made uh, that we should be able to take on some of the social media um, organizations uh, who are using uh, content that we put so much into developing, uh, but they're using it for free and they're actually growing their uh, following without uh, paying their due to the people who do the hard work. So thank you for that. Um, there was, you also mentioned the issue of um, recruiting and training young journalists. And uh, I'll, I'll go right into the questions. There's a question from Collins Mutika in Malawi. He says, what can be done to coax new entries into in investigative journalism? He says, my observation in Malawi is that very few journalists are willing to take investigative journalism as their niche area. So you know, he wants to understand what can we do? Benin, if I can chip in on that one, um, I think I think we need to start talking about the joys of this profession as well. You know, we um, it we obviously have lots of challenges that, and we need to focus on it. But um, I think you know, talking and and being champions for investigative journalism about the power you still have to transform your society, to expose wrongdoing, and talking about our successes, um, where we actually have where our journalism has changed the world for many people and for many countries. Um, I think it's incredibly important that we also talk about that as a starting point. Um, secondly, I think you know we need to encourage specialization. Not all journalists should be investigative journalists, but um, there are definitely, if I look at my own newsroom, there's definitely some junior journalists who've got immense potential um, to stick to a story, that, that absolute tenacity you need to stay with your story as an investigative journalist. And, you know, identify them early and give them breaks into um, exploring specific topics. Make time for them to stick to a story or a beat. Um, that would just be two, two, con uh, two ideas from, from my side. Uh, thank you for that, Adrian. Um, uh, I think you've just made a good um, pitch for the end. Uh, for a session in perhaps the next uh, African Investigative Journalism Conference on uh, the joys of investigative journalism. So I hope somebody in the background is, has picked that up and should be able to take it up. Um, now, one of our colleagues, uh, Arnaud Odrawago uh, from Burkina Faso, has not been able to join us. He's had challenges uh, connecting. Uh, so uh, we will perhaps not be able to hear from him unless he joins at the last minute, uh, but uh, please keep the questions coming. I think for now, uh, we will go into more of the questions. Um, and there's um, one here for Victor. Uh, Albert Shara says, Victor, you rushed on the methodology of your, uh, of your research. Can you help me understand your methodology because I see it goes beyond Africa? Are these well-established IG centers only, or is it a mix? And how are you addressing the issue of the quality of data collected from new and well-established IG centers? Victor? Thanks, Benon. I had already responded on, on, on this question. But through, yes, uh, within the, 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 the research, the methodology was one, we, we obviously sat down and, and, and looked at what is investigative journalism in terms of the, the broadest sense and we were guided by the UNESCO definition of who, what is investigative journalism in terms of looking at quality of journalism, public interest and related 
things. Then two, when we started uh, for uh, looking at the, in terms of mapping, like I mentioned, uh, one, we used uh, snowballing, obviously referrals uh, from uh, colleagues. There's a number of uh, work, uh, a lot of work that has been done uh, by Reuters, by Professor Aston, by yourself, a lot of that mentioned wonderful work that, 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 that's happening around investigative journalism in Africa. So the study was both in Africa and on, on, on Africa, because they are also centers, people who are working collaborat collaboratively with centers and independent journalists in Africa who are producing content in Africa. I remember I mentioned the, the thing like, like uh, BBC, the, the Eyes on Africa on BBC, for example, and others. So th that's how, so in the referrals uh, and using your network, Benin was very helpful and other studies that uh, for, uh, for your media institute and which is doing and, and, and picking also from the list of people who are attending this, uh, who had already shown interest in attending this conference. That's how we were able to get a big, big, big sample. And what we did is that we sent out uh, to some of the centers that met uh, our requirements, which were nearly about 17, uh, a questionnaire of 17 questions that looked at various things we did send out. And, and we received uh, responses which we have been looking at. But more importantly also, in cases where we did not get responses, for example, we looked at existing literature like online, their YouTube, their Facebook, their websites, and other literature that says something about those centers. So again, that, that we also looked at that and, and, and compared notes. So we worked within uh, those parameters. Uh, we looked at their website, we looked at existing literature, we looked, looked at, we used referral snowballing where people mentioned a number of people to us. We used the WITS uh, database, we used the GNC database, which then helped us. In. And that's why I mentioned that we are still open. We are aware that people who are working uh, on Africa, but outside Africa, and we're still open. We are encouraging people who did not feature in the list that I shared to continue uh, sending us more information and we'll be happy to include them. Okay, uh, thank you, Victor. Um, there is uh, a, a question from, uh, that actually two questions in, in one, uh, sort of addressing the same issue, and I would like to direct this to Moton Rayo. Uh, there is one from Aliyu Rabe who says sometimes regionalism and ethnicity used to affect investigative journalism in West African countries through bias and wrong interpretation of data. Uh, that's a statement. Uh, then Tawanda Majoni asks the question, he says, how best can we um, foster in-country solidarity among investigative journalists? Um, could you also tell us uh, the interventions that are in place to help investigative journalists facing persecution and threats? Uh, Moton Rayo, please take that up. Thank you, uh, Benon. On the first part about collaboration, I, I believe that a lot of collaboration is already happening within countries and across regions in, in Africa. Um, in Nigeria, um, non-governmental organizations who are focused on rights to access to information and who are focused on defending uh, journalists are active in support to journalists against repressive uh, laws and against uh, repressive um, activities of government. So these are already ongoing and uh, I believe very strongly that um, they will grow as time, as time goes on. Uh, the issue of ethnicity and uh, regionalism, religion, uh, generally in Africa is, uh, is a big issue. It's a big issue because again, it goes back to the egg and chicken that I started with. It is our environment that is influencing even the media. And uh, sometimes, for instance, in the case of Nigeria, sometimes uh, the media does a great job at reporting these issues as basically human issues but sometimes it um, actually uh, reports them also with the bias of the regions and what it hears on, on the streets. And then um, which also can, can fuel the conflicts in the region. So um, the challenges of the media are linked to the challenges that, that society has uh, generally. Um, a quick mention though of um, what um, Adrian said, which I quickly want to highlight is, the fact that, uh, you know, uh, we are getting a lot of non-for-profit news and it is, uh, it is great, it is, uh, it is nice, 
Well, Adrian mentioned the fact that uh, reader revenue is the big deal that we have to focus on. Uh, Non-for-profit uh, support, especially from international organization is great, but I see that uh, it might not be sustainable. In the long run, our people need to be educated enough to want to pay for media. And we need to uh, do media in a way that we do not uh, separate ourselves from the media. And it goes back to the question of uh, one of the major things that our monitoring of the media has shown is that media can go so technical in its language that average people do not understand the language or what it means by what it is saying. And so they are not able to connect with it and they are not able to take up that, that fight for the better society that we want. So in terms of language, it is also important for media to, to speak what the people uh, yes, I seem to be losing you, sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah, uh, so thank you for that response, uh, Mosvayo. Uh, there is a question that I would like to direct to uh, Gihad Abbas. It's from Shindong Bala. He says, some officials request for questions days before the investigative interviews. Is it proper to submit this? Should I go ahead and give the questions? Um, and uh, given the kind of environment that uh, uh, Gihad operates in, I thought uh, she would be best placed to answer this question. Gihad, please. Okay, thank you, Ben. Uh, my answer is uh, it's not professional at all to give the source or the officials uh, questions uh, before the interview because you will. Um, you will miss a lot his real reactions, uh, his response about your uh, questions. So mainly I give them the main topic about my interview. It's very normal that the official will ask you um, uh, what the topic, and you can give him only the main headlines, the main topic, and um, and you have to keep the sur surprise element on your interview. And you have to de decide open the, the character of the official or his history, background, uh, his character or her character, um, how it's going to happen, the interview. Will you ask the tough questions in the, the beginning or the soft one and break the ice and then ask a um, tough question. And then if he got very angry, you just take a step back and ask um, um, a more easy one and then come back to the toughest our the, the real uh, questions and uh, so you never give a source or an official the questions or the or the information the all information that you have thank you for that that is okay. that was really good yes yeah. um now there are two questions addressed directly to adrian uh, there's one from Caroline Lunga. She says, uh, thank you for the insightful presentations, Adrian. How can the problem of disinformation bots be dealt with? Are, med are media organizations equipped enough technologically to do this? Uh, what's your experience in South Africa, uh, Adrian? Um, th thanks, Ben. And, uh, Carolyn, I'm afraid the answer is no. I don't think we are equipped to tackle bots from just from within our newsrooms. Um, we're going to need partners in technology. Um, I think starting with those platforms themselves. So I think, like I said earlier, a frank open discussion with the likes of Facebook and Twitter is needed. Um, secondly, we've been managed, we managed to track um, during the height of the Gupta leaks. Uh, there was a there was a, a serious disinformation bot campaign on Twitter specifically, and we managed to track some of the originators of those websites that were used by these bots uh, back to India and to Israel, um, where they, it seems there are companies paid to actually create these bot farms um, and 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 Twitter campaigns. Um, so to expose these companies when we find them, I think that would be effective. Um, but then also to do good old journalism, to find the people who pay for them, the clients or people we know in our countries, you know, the politicians and the organizations and the companies who pay them to counter us, um, to find out who they are um, and how this is being done. Um, but I think, I think to start with discussions with those platforms are important. 
Okay, thank you for that. Uh, there is a second question. Um, Johnson Mayamba uh, picked up on something you talked about bringing in young uh, journalists into the, the beat. He says specialization into investigative journalism is good. However, most of our newsrooms are either not willing to invest in such journalism or are incapacitated. The risks associated with this area also do not make it any easier. How can we help the interested journalists without them feeling underpaid and risk uh, free, especially for freelancers? Yeah, I think I think here the onus is also on us, you know, as editors and investigative journalists to to make the call and to make the case for investing in investigative journalism. I mean, in my own experience, uh, stories by investigative journalists, well-researched stories and exposés does very well for our publications. A lot of people read it and actually subscribe to read those stories. So it is also good for our publications to invest in investigative journalism. Um, I think that, uh, you know, it is it's expensive. Uh, uh, investigative journalists are often well paid for very good reason, um, but they also take longer, obviously, to produce stories. But the, the, the investment um, is worth it. Um, I've seen it many a time, and I think that's an argument that, that we should, should make. Um, in terms of the risk, uh, you know, uh, in our country, we, um, we luckily have the support of, of an institution like the South African National Editors Forum that speaks out um, uh, in favor of media freedom. Um, and we su generally support each other as colleagues when there are legal risks. We often um, take on court cases together as media companies. So I think as colleagues, we, we need to support each other in that regard. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, one, uh, we are running out of time, so I'll ask perhaps one more question. Um, it comes from Galax FEC, uh, where he or she says, you will realize that in most journalism and mass communication departments, the instructors and professors have very little or no knowledge of investigative journalism. Most of those are into the beautiful general journalism, but do not largely learn from institutions of higher learning but within the newsroom. So yeah, he's asking, um, how can we work to strike a convergence between newsrooms and classrooms in, in order to produce the kind of inve investigative journalists that we need on the continent? I'll uh, ask uh, Moten Rayo to respond to that. Okay, uh, so this is something that we've tried to do at the Wallachian Class Center for Investigative Journalism. We have tried to, as an organization, we've tried to build, bring together media professionals alongside the academia, alongside other stakeholders um, to learn together. Again, the collaborative approach, which I mentioned um, as the Rush approach, which is a learning approach to, to journalism, to actually bring stakeholders together this time around, not to interview any of them, but to just listen and hear different perspectives. So um, as the person mentioned, uh, we also do a lot of mentoring and sometimes we get um, people in the academia to work with people on the field and they, both parties learn. The people on the field learn from the academia, the people in the academia also learn from the people on the field. So we do need to consciously, very intentionally bring different parties together um, to learn from uh, one another so that we can build a um, profession. Okay, thank you. Um, we still have lots of questions, but unfortunately we don't have much time anymore. And frankly, I was enjoying the exchange of ideas and uh, experiences from different parts of the continent, uh, but time is not on our side. So I will, uh, first of all, apologize to everybody whose question I have not asked. I'm sorry about that. Uh, but there, there is a session that's coming next, uh, still on challenges facing investigative journalists, but this time uh, women. So if you can follow that and still ask a question related to what you have, um, and what you had asked this time around, but we have not answered, please do. Um, so in closing, I would like to thank uh, the AIJC team for organizing this session and the conference generally. Uh, thank you to the translators, the audience, and thank you to Victor Buire, Moton Rayo Alaka, Jihad um, Abbas, and Adrian Basson. Unfortunately, we couldn't hear from Arnaud or Draugo, uh, but we hope uh, we will be able to hear
from him in other subsequent sessions. Uh, this session, um, the session that follows after this one, as I said, is on the challenges facing women investigative journalists. Please do join uh, that panel and listen to uh, those very specific challenges that uh, women investigative journalists face. Uh, after that session, we will have the launch of a book by Professor Anton Haber. The book is titled, For the Record, Behind the Headlines in an Era of State Capture. Uh, please join that session as well and learn, you know, what uh, he's been able to capture in, in the book. For now, from me and everyone behind this session, goodbye and have a great day. Thank you. <laughs>